Great, so I'm uh, very honoured to have with me Stephen Gaines. Uh, so looking forward to this interview, the brand new book, All You Need Is Love. Um, thankfully, it seems to be the book that everybody is talking about. Um, so I'm very glad that you give me some time to discuss this. I take I'm glad very to hear busy. people are talking about it. That's great. That's what you want as an author, isn't it? Yes, no, absolutely. Well, I, most of all, I want people to uh, kind of in, enjoy this book because it's been locked away for 40 years, literally, these tapes. So, yeah, Final. No, it's amazing. It's amazing because, of course, um, Love You Make was groundbreaking in a way when, when that came out. Um, I know people have used different words and stuff, but polarizing. I, I think, polarizing, yes. <laughs> so, what, what a word. But I think it was. I remember with all the books that I've been reading over the years and reading The Love You Make, I went, oh, this is how I like history, which is I like to read the interviews. That's what I want. And and that's what that brought. Um, and then, of course, as you say, the, how, what, 100 hours or more of tapes you've had? Yes, probably. I mean... Uh, I, I didn't, uh, I was just trying to figure it out because now of all times, but I was just trying to figure it out. There, there are uh, 70 some odd tapes, I think. Um, and they were 90 minute tapes, but not all of them went 90 minutes. So there may be 150 hours or 100 and wow. something hours uh, of tapes. I know there are over 200,000 words. And then um, somebody, uh, there's a famous quote. Somebody said, how do you write a bestseller? And the answer was, you cut out the boring parts. So <laughs> I, I tried to cut out the boring parts because if you if you listen to these tapes, which were made in, in 1980, most of them, almost all of them, just in the weeks or months before John was, was killed, um, there are lots of things in there, you know, like, would you like another cup of tea? You know, uh, the doorbell rings, it's the dry cleaning, it's stuff like that. So I had to cut that out. And then also the tapes really uh, weren't about about music. Um, of course, they were about music, but I didn't ask them specific questions about songs or did no. Ringo play the drums or was it Paul or any of that. I wanted to know the mechanism, how the Beatles worked, how they got to be who they are. What did Joko really break up the Beatles? Was Linda part of it? So I wanted to write about the personal side, and and that's what the tapes have. Yeah. So were you before you got to work with with Peter Brown? Were you already a Beatles fan? Yes, I was a Beatles fan. Um, I, I think I, I, you know, at first I thought they were just another rock and roll group, and I want to hold your hand and all that stuff and everything. And I, I, I got more serious about them with I think Rubber Soul. I think that was very important to me, uh, the music and just the way it sounded. And I realized that things were changing and uh, it helped educate me and lead me down a path to uh, appreciating music differently. Um, and then I was, um, um, I, I went to a, a summer school at the University of Southern California on the other coast from where I live um, for film. And there were a lot of film students that was living in the dormitories. And somebody said to me, have you heard Sergeant Pepper's Lonely, Club, Lonely Hearts Club Band? I said, no. <clears throat> so he had a portable little record player. And he brought it into my room. And he put it on. And it was, I, I can't begin to tell you how deeply, deeply it affected me. And how, I mean, that was a new arena. The Beatles had invented something completely different uh, yeah. that that nobody else had achieved that way before. Nobody else thought of music that way before. And, and, and the lyrics and the songs, I was just enchanted. So that guy that brought in the little record player, he didn't get it back for the whole rest of the summer. <laughs> Every time he wanted it back, was, oh, no, no, please, one more day. I have to listen to this album one more time. And um, so after that, I was completely, that was 67. So after that, I was com completely, completely hooked. And it was also one of the people who were dopey enough to be angry at them when the band broke up. I was just furious with them. How dare they deprive me yeah. of, yeah. Of, of, uh, of this wonderful, wonderful music. And also, they were all kind of crazy rumors at the time about why the band broke up. So, But they're still around now, aren't they? 
they are, and uh, it's just silly things. Yoko did not break up the Beatles. Believe you me, you know there was there were there was already problems uh, way before Yoko showed up. I, I do think though that John um, uh, weaponized Yoko. John uh, knew that he was going to annoy the other Beatles by having Yoko constantly at his side in his arms all the time. Remember, these guys had been in the studios uh, without anybody else there. Even Brian Epstein, the manager, didn't yeah. go to the studios. It was just forbidden. It was something that you didn't do. They were working. And and to inject um, a, a love interest, especially somebody as complicated and different as Yoko, uh, was offensive. And as you read in the book, and as we've already read, uh, uh, Ringo went to John. I mean, everybody said to John, what's this about with Yoko in the studio all the time? And he said, that's that's the way I like it. And so Ringo said, they all said the same thing. Well, that's just John. You know, they, they were kind of used to that. So, but I think I think he really weaponized her. And I think he used her to aggravate them. And I mean, it was inappropriate for her to make suggestions on their music or stuff. Or if I was her, I would have said, you know, John, it's not right for me to be there. I'll be waiting for you at home, you know, with a, a Sunday joint. To stay easy. You know, I'll be waiting for you at home, <laughs> Sunday joint, and, and you go make music with the others. Um, and then I think because of that, Paul added Linda to the mix. Um, and then it was each each of them had, you know, Linda was really tough. Let me tell you something. Yoko was tough, too, in her own way. But Linda was 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 really a, a tough lady. And, um, you know, I spent a, a weekend at their house in in the countryside. Uh, Paul invited me and Peter Brown and uh, down. And uh, it, it's the first time I really got to know Linda um pretty well and who she was and everything and um listen paul loved her um so he really deeply deeply loved her and and she deeply loved him and they understood each other uh in a way and that's you know the thing that i remember and i i, I don't mean to be disrespectful but the one thing that i remember most clearly about linda the first moment that i met her was that she didn't shave her legs uh, I know this sounds ridiculous, but she had very hairy legs. <laughs> <laughs> and also, um, when we first arrived, she was in the kitchen. She had kind of a, a mother's helper or somebody there. She was in the kitchen uh, chopping up. They were vegetarians, making what looked like gruel to me. I mean, I didn't know we were going to have to have that for lunch. I mean, it was just, you know, she she cooked. And then the other thing that she said to me, do you mind if I go on like this? No, no, little, no, absolutely. The other thing that she said to me was, uh, after I was there a couple of hours, she said to me, um, would you do us a huge favor? Sure. When you go back to America, would you mail us two pounds of grass? I said, no, Linda. I'm I, No, I'll get arrested. She said, no, 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 not at all. I'll give you the address, and you put a, a fake return address on it. And if, if, we're, if it gets busted, we'll... Fans send us marijuana all the time. And I think that's true. I think that's probably true. So she wow. said, you know, we don't, you know, Paul will give you a couple of thousand dollars before you leave. I said, I'm sorry, Linda, I can't. I absolutely can't do that, you know. And and then the other thing that I remember uh, about being in Paul and Linda's house, it was circular, the house, and the rooms didn't go all the way up to the ceiling. Right. So you could hear everything i mean if you went to the bathroom toilet you could hear you know everything and so i said paul um how how do you and linda like make love um uh, with you know the, the sound and he said well we realize that's what was making all the babies so we stopped <laughs> <laughs> he said and, and then the other thing that i want to tell you is i must have been there a day before i realized that there was a grand piano in the living room. It had so much stuff over it and everything. That place was such a mess. I mean, a, a good housekeeper, Linda, was not. But that place was uh, just an, an, an awful, awful mess. And um, Paul was an angel to interview. Um, very, very smart. I think you'll, if, his interview in the book, I don't know if you oh, know. I it, love it. Yeah. Intelligent. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a really good interview that 
I really enjoyed that. And that, that's one of the great things. Um, I love the way you've done this book, is that here's the series of interviews. And, and that's as a historian and an author myself. That's what I, that's what I want to see, is here's all these people, and here's their version of the story in their words. Exactly. Not being crafted, not being finessed, not being messed around with, but... No, no comments from me. Just let them speak. I mean, I ask them questions, of course. Yeah. But yes, just let them speak. I was so lucky. You know, Pete, it was because of Peter Brown that I got to sure. meet them all. And, and so I was very, very lucky to be able to interview them that way. Yeah. And I think I mean, you go down the, the list of the, of the people. And I like that it's not all just the bigger names, as it were. You know, but, but picking people. I mean, Alistair Taylor that I'd met, a uh, lovely guy. You know, interviewing Jeffrey Ellis. You know, right. What an important guy behind the scenes. Absolutely he was. He he actually ran the business for Brian yeah. because Brian didn't like business. So it was Jeffrey who was behind the scenes. And Jeffrey was from Liverpool too. Yeah. So he was kind of um, a trusted. <clears throat> I remember him saying to me, and I think it's in the interviews also, was when um, Brian asked him if he wanted uh, to work for the Beatles he wasn't certain but then he got you know you get so swept up with the Beatles when you were part of them at that point it was so amazing it was such a rush and there were so many things going on that you just you know you went with it and he loved being there and he loved working for Brian so for the Beatles so yeah. that was that was great and there were there were a couple of other people um uh, John John Dunbar um the the yeah. their lawyer the lawyer, the drug lawyer, the the lawyer that defended them and everything. He was absolutely fascinating. And um, who was it who told the story about John putting a cigarette out in a glass of water? Um, that was uh, the film producer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, so all those outside the, the, people. Yeah, the great ahead. little stories. Um, I mean, I suppose one of the interesting ones to, to do would have been uh, Magic Alex. Mm-hmm. Boy, Magic Alex, what he didn't do, he was evil. He was he was so desperate to be John's friend. Yeah. He was so desperate to, you know. And the fact that he was sent on a mission to Italy to spy on Cynthia so John could sue her for divorce because she was going to sue John for divorce. I mean, she, John was the adulterer in it. Yeah. And, and it wasn't Cynthia, but... Yoko was already taking so much flack that John wanted to put some of the responsibility and blame on, on Cynthia. So he sent Magic Alex down there to spy on her and and to come back with the dirt. And and also he was it was crazy the stuff that he was inventing or the not. claims he made. Just ridiculous. I love Neil Aspinall. I said to Neil Aspinall, who was the true fifth beetle. I said to Neil Aspinall, um, what about Magic Alex? And he said, he kept on sending me apples with radios in them or something. <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine, especially Neil Aspinall is kind of a down-to-earth Liverpool guy, you know, seeing all this crazy stuff going around. And yeah. uh, I loved Neil. He was tough. Um, and he'd never been really interviewed like that before. Absolutely. I mean, that, that is such a coup for the yeah, book. Peter Brown. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's Having Neil theory. there, so that yeah. did, no, talk a bit more about Neil. What was he like? Was it? Was he? Was he? Was he cagey? Was he open? No, no. he didn't like being interviewed um, yeah. at all. But the the you know the first thing he said was, um, and it became the theme uh, when we took all of these interviews out of the bank vault after 40 years. He said, I'm going to tell you a story and somebody else is going to tell you the story and it won't be. And I'll, you know, I was there and it wasn't what happened. And <clears throat> that's exactly the truth. You know, everybody and, and Peter Brown, just the other day, uh, he was interviewed by the New York Times and they asked him about discrepancies. Then he said, he used the, he said, well, it depends where you were sitting. And I love yeah. that expression. You know, if, if you're looking at w what point of view you were looking at it through. So um, uh, that's what that's what I think Neil Aspinall meant. And he was he was pretty honest. Uh, um, he was very honest. Um, 
I found that there were places that I didn't want to go with Neil Aspinall because I didn't want to turn him off. So I didn't want to ask him anything uh, too private about the Beatles. But I asked the Beatles themselves. I didn't interview John for this, but I asked the Beatles themselves private things, and they didn't, they didn't seem to mind at all. In, in fact, Ringo said to me, and I think it's in the interview, um, ask me more questions. I like this. So I think it's the first time you ever said that to a reporter. <laughs> yeah. so, no, so it, uh, it's a real coup to have people like like Neil in there. And as you say, it's it's not what a lot of authors have done in so many books, and they just rehash interviews from thing. years before, and they then mis misplace and they take stuff out of context, move it around, and they, they just mess around with Beatles history and. I know it's certainly something I've found over the years. You can take any event, and as you say, it's it's depending on where you were sitting. You know, take a, the day John meets Paul. You know, I know the lads from the Quarrymen really well. Spoken to them many times over the years, and they've all got a slightly different take. But but that's the whole thing with history. Right. If everybody's telling you exactly the same story, that's when you get suspicious. Right, that's true. That's true, that and it, it really depends upon upon where you where you were sitting, and what happened. So we made these tapes for uh, the Love You Make, which was the polarizing book that we wrote, and, yeah. and then we put the tapes into. I put the tapes into my bank vault, uh, and Peter and I had uh, discussions, sometimes heated discussions, about what was going to happen to those tapes. Yeah. I felt that they had historic value. These tapes beyond. Absolutely the value to fans. And I realized that the Beatles had were being taught in universities yeah. and that this was not just a passing thing and that these tapes really should be out to the public. So my idea was to give them to a university, to give them away to a university. Yeah. Um, and I, uh, and Peter was against that. I uh, UCLA uh, asked me for my Beach Boy tapes. I wrote a book about the Beach Boys. And I said, only if you'll take my Beatle tapes. And they said, no, we don't want the Beatle tapes. Can you imagine how stupid that was? What? So, I know. So then I said to Peter, listen, let's go to the University of Liverpool. Give them in your name, Peter. It doesn't have to be, you know, I mean, my name can be on the thing, but the Peter Brown mm -hmm. tapes. Listen, Liverpool, what a great place. No, he wouldn't do that. I tried the New York Public Library, the Clive Davis School of Music, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I went to all of these places and there wasn't really a fit. So uh, a, a long time went by and um, Peter uh, and I both getting up in years. And I said, it, it's now or never, Peter. You know, we've got to do something. So it was against the law to play the tapes of uh, the voices of living people um without their permission so we we couldn't do that because we weren't going to get paul's permission or yoko's permission but yeah. i could i could transcribe the tapes and publish that yeah and once that idea came about um and so we went to a publisher and they said you're going to give these away <laughs> and i said you know that so it's so important yeah. these what these tapes that somehow they got to get out there they just have to get out there. So um, he found a publisher, St. Martin's Press, who understood that there wasn't going to be a narrative, that it was just going to be the tapes and stuff like that. And they understood that that was the route yeah. to go. And and that's the book that well, that was published today, in fact. Yeah. Yeah. Happy Pub and, Day. Yeah, and, and it's fantastic for that because it's of historical significance. And I think one of the beauties I think gets picked up uh, the other is, of course, the timing of the interviews is not long before John is murdered. And so you're getting a more honest opinion before. Mm -hmm. And this, I know this is something that, that Paul's talked about over the years of one of the burdens he's had is that John's killed age 40. And with anybody who dies before their time, it's sort of lifted on a pedestal. And you, you, you're going against a myth where... The timing, in a way, obviously you didn't get to interview John, but you got a more honest perspective before you lost John. If, if John it, the, the tapes were done between September and November, John was killed December 8th, I believe. 
<clears throat> so all of those were done except for the Yoko tape. So John was still alive and people spoke more freely about their feelings yeah. about him. And people said kind of, you know, uh, George Harrison said John was a piece of SH and, and uh, was really shocked. And, and here's the thing, though. Uh, they might have said angry things about John, but they all longed for him. Paul yeah. wanted so badly to renew that friendship. Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah. He really didn't care anymore about the business stuff. And George said, you know, I wonder if John read I, Me, Mine, you know, his autobiography, and if he's angry with me. And so they, they all really wanted to see. And, you know, Cynthia Lennon never got over John. She never got over John. She, yeah. uh, she stayed with me for two weeks here at my house when I was writing the book. That was an interesting experience, having Cynthia here. I loved yeah. Cynthia. She was she was great. You know, Cynthia nearly drowned and died here. Uh, <laughs> we, when uh, Cynthia wanted to be an artist, and when yeah. I interviewed her in, I guess it was Wales, I'm not exactly sure where it was, um, but she had a, 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 a breakfast, uh, a bed and breakfast, and uh, she showed me some of her drawings and paintings. And I said, you know, Cynthia, you're so famous. Uh, uh, you should come out to the Hamptons. This is after John was killed. You should come out to where I live, where there are a lot of art galleries, and I'll get you an art show. And she thought I was, you know, bullshitting her. But um, I went to a gallery, the Tower Gallery. I said, Cynthia Lennon, all this stuff. He said, oh, my God, yes, that would be fascinating. And so let's do that. So she came here, big opening art show. A lot of people went. She didn't sell a single thing, unfortunately. I, I have one of them here still. But... Um, then we went out to dinner um, at a, at a, we had a lot of wine and uh, during dinner and she drank a lot of wine and um, we were in the car. I had a friend with me, <clears throat> a colleague, Joseph Olshan, who was an editor and, and, a, and a writer, but his exercise that he'd been doing his entire life was swimming. That was what he did every day. He swam yeah. for hours, which was a good thing because um, we're in the car driving home and Cynthia says, let's go to the beach and go waiting. You know, roll up your, your pants. It was pitch black out. You know, you roll up your pants and she said, I'll yeah. tie my dress here at the side. And she had a girlfriend with her too that she brought from Liverpool. So I said, okay, great. It sounds like fun. So we were all holding hands, the four of us, walking into the ocean. It was just up to our ankles. And then a huge wave came out of nowhere and knocked us all over. All four of us went down like bowling pins. Boom. And so I got up, her friend got up, Joe Olshan got up. We said, where's Cynthia? We started yelling, Cynthia, Cynthia. And then we saw about 20 feet out in the ocean, the, her skirt billowing up. She was face down. I mean, it was terrifying. And so Joe is a strong swimmer. Swimmer, He dove into the ocean, swam out, pulled her head out of the water, dragged her back to the shore. Um, we all composed ourselves. Uh, yeah. It was sopping wet. We all got into my car. And for some reason, I don't understand what this reason is. We started to laugh, but silly, hysterical, crying laughter, laughing so much, I couldn't start the car. That was the weirdest response I felt. So finally, after we had laughed ourselves silly, uh, uh, Cynthia said, um, I, I, I'd love to sit by a fire when we get back to your place. So I realized I didn't have any wood. You know, I mean, it was the dumbest thing not to have any wood. So I said, don't worry about it. So I had all these newspapers. So what we did was, is we rolled up the newspapers really, really tight. And, and we rolled up about 20, 30 of them. And we built a little, you know, teepee of newspapers yeah. in the fireplace. And I lit it. We were all sitting there. And it flamed up beautifully for about four minutes. And then it all turned to <laughs> ash. It was over. And Cynthia said, um... That's the story of my life, a, a, a paper fire. Oh, wow. Oh, no, I know. I know. What a thing to say. And I realized, you know, it burned brightly, and yeah. that was all ashes for her. And uh, so I've always, I've always loved Cynthia. I've always, you know, thought she was, she was great. Wonderful then, lady. Wonderful, wonderful lady. And, and then um, uh, Patty, you know, was yeah. just... You know, I, I, you fall in love with Patty. She really <laughs> knows. She really knows how to treat her men. And I'm gay, and I fell in love with her. <laughs> I, 
I mean, she was just, she, she said two words to me. She said that Eric kept on giving her stuffed animals, whether it was a birthday or Christmas or whatever, gave it the same gift. And it was always the same animal. And so a couple of days or nights later, I don't know, we were having some drinks or something. And she was sitting next to me on the, on the sofa. And I said, uh, I can't remember what was the kind of animal that, that Eric kept on giving you. And she said, guess. I said, uh, she said, come on. And I said, uh, it was frogs. And she said to me, good boy. And I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> no, good boy. Oh, God. It was so sexy. And so, well, that's why Layla was written for her. And that's why Somewhere was written for her. And, yeah. and everything else. She really, you know, and I would have written a song for her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, I'm so, sorry, I'm going on and on, but no, no, no. It, it, it's great because I, I, the one thing that comes through from reading these is their lovely conversations with these people. It it doesn't feel like <clears throat> like you'd often get in a, in a newspaper interview. I've got this film to promote, therefore I'm going to tell you this. And it's the same thing. It's it's conversations, and obviously having Peter Brown there. Oh, wow. Makes the massive difference. And it was incredible because they trusted Peter. Yeah. And uh, I asked them questions that if Peter hadn't introduced me to them, I never would have been able to ask them. Also, Peter and I had this thing that we did. He sometimes was not there at the beginning of the interview. He'd say, I turn on the tape recorder or whatever. We did this with Paul. And then he'd say, you've got to excuse me. You guys start. And then he disappeared for a half an hour, 45 minutes. And so there were things that I think I could ask Paul that if Peter Brown was there, it would have been a little bit untowards. It would have been, oh, yeah. you know. Yeah. So <clears throat> Peter wasn't there for a whole bunch of the interviews. Um, but, well, he came in and out and stuff like that. But uh, having him introduce us uh, and, and giving uh, these interviews his blessing was a tremendous uh, Tremendous importance and help. Yeah. yeah. And of course, we have to finish with the, the pantomime baddie of Alan Klein that you got to. I mean, I've heard so many stories about I was at least, uh, what was I reading? Oh, Ken Mansfield's book. And Ken was saying how he could seduce. And he said, even knowing everything, Ken knew everything that had gone on with Apple. And Klein was trying to get him to go and work for him and said, and I was so nearly taken in by it all. What what was he like? To a, a brilliant, a brilliant con man. But you know, I, I, before I met him, I read all these things. He was sleazy. He was dirty. He was fat. He was rude. He was greasy. And all of those things were true when I met him. Right. The second he opened up his mouth, um, he knew every song. Uh, he had every, every fact and figure was in his brain, a um, way to make deals, way to do things. He was absolutely brilliant, but he wasn't on the level, you yeah. know, and he, he was really, really, he was sly, but he wasn't on the level. I can't imagine that John and Yoko fell for that. I just, I just can't imagine. And that George went along and that Ringo went along. Absolutely. What, 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 why this guy was so obviously a charlatan. It was really crazy. And they all turned against Paul. And, yeah. and, and of course, Paul having his, his wife or his girlfriend at the time, her younger brother represent him, you know, this uh, Harvard or Princeton educated, you know, lawyer, uh, fancy schmancy lawyer, you know, yeah. up against the sleaze bag, Alan Klein. It just, it just didn't work. So the first time I went to view Alan Klein and I started asking him serious questions in the first five minutes, he said, sorry, I didn't realize that it was going to take this long. I can't talk to you now. We have to reschedule. So I thought that was going to be the end of it. Right. But um, he did. He rescheduled with us. I came back and he just let me ask anything, went through the whole thing, gave me a complete and thorough interview. And he was more prepared the yeah. second time. And um, so maybe the same thing with Alex, too. same thing with Magic Alex. Yeah. You know? Another, how did they believe what Magic Alex was saying? How stupid can you believe that you'll paint a wall and it'll be stereo speakers, the painting? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, of all the things, you know, and, and, uh, 
but people tell incredible stories about him of course he did that e the evil deed you know he 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 helped uh john divorce uh cynthia uh, yeah and uh, so th there were amazing characters in this. If you thought this was like a soap opera, and the most Absolutely. famous people in the world, this is happening to you know. So and so talented, so brilliant. I, when I when I watch that that uh, that Peter Jackson movie, oh, uh, get back here. Yeah, and and I heard uh, John. I don't remember specifically, but I heard John picking out some notes on his guitar, and I thought to myself, "I know that song. That's going to become a world famous song." This is just how they did it. They did. Yeah, they couldn't read music. Isn't yeah, exactly. Remarkable? They well, were. I, really I think one of the greatest things, and because somebody asked me about this recently, and and I've always used it as my lazy excuse for never learning to read or write music. And, and so I've always played by ear. But I think it was the best thing that could have happened to them because if they didn't learn the musical rules, they didn't know the rules they were breaking. That's and, that was the, and that is the great thing, I think, about, about the, the Beatles and what they did. They made the rules. Yeah, I never heard that before, but you're absolutely right. That's 100% what happened. They made the rules. Yeah, they, um, they did and it's interesting because the name Beatles comes from the four four beat, doesn't it? I think that's where it comes from. That and which was the typical rock and roll. Well, the, 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 I think yeah, there was it was right. the four four. The, the, that was the rock and roll. That's the, that's the heartbeat uh, right. of rock and roll. Um, and that's it. So the, I, you, you've done an absolutely incredible job. Um, I love the love you make. I thought that was a great book. And I'm so glad. Polarizing uh, book. <sighs> Polarizing, and, and, and it's all because of the John Lennon thing. It's all because of John and Brian, you know, saying that naughty thing about. But John. That, uh, I mean, what do you think? Happened? What do you think happened? Do you think John, I was wrong to write that something probably happened in Spain? No, I don't, because the more that I've researched and looked into what the Beatles did and what they got up to in Hamburg, even before they were famous, where everything was on offer of every John he he was an experimenter and I think whatever happened I think the key thing about that trip was that I think we're going into suits and becoming a pop group not a rock and roll group I think John was losing some control and maybe they were becoming more Paul's group Paul was uh -huh. a lot happier mm -hmm. with the pop group with the suits with all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. And I think John maybe was felt he was losing some control because it was his group, mm -hmm. and he had to get Brian back onto his side. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big part of it. I think, and then I also think um, he said that he loved Brian. I don't mean that in a sexual way, but no. he said that he really loved Brian and wanted Brian, and 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 Brian really loved John most Absolutely. of all. And Paul was always the suspicious one of Brian. So yeah, <clears throat> Brian Epstein. So. Um, it worked out. It's just a remarkable part of uh, history. Absolutely. Today is Peter Brown's birthday. Oh, and it is. Yes, today of is, the, is the publishing uh, uh, date here in America yeah. of of All You Need Is Love. So there is a uh, oh, you got the you got the uh, English version there, yeah. and this is the American version. See, I like I like the English version because it says the end of the Beatles, yeah. and this just says in their own words. So. Um, but anyway, I'm I'm going. I live two two and a half uh, hours away from Manhattan. I live on the tip of Long Island, and so I'm getting on a bus now, and I'm going to ride the two and a half hours to toast Peter, and uh, he's giving a publishing party. Oh, um, wonderful! Well, wish him a happy birthday from me. I spoke to him briefly uh, a number of years ago over over one book I, I was writing at the time, and he was very gracious. Gave me some time. I had a lovely chat with him. Um, so wish him a happy birthday from me and the best of luck with the book. I highly recommend it. Thank you for doing this. David, if you ever want to talk to me again about anything, I'm here. Sure. I'm here. Sure. Thank Brilliant. you for your support. Ah, uh, my pleasure, Stephen. Thank you so Thank much. You. And, uh, enjoy nice the rest day. of your day. Thank you so much. Bye Take now. Take care. Bye-bye.